This is On The Ledge podcast, the podcast that takes you into the world of houseplants and never lets you escape. That sounded a bit sinister, didn't it? But what I'm trying to say is we all love houseplants. We're always going to love houseplants and we're here to stay. This is Jane Perrone. I am your host and this week is going to be a great show. with Daryl Cheng of Houseplant Journal, the Canadian houseplant powerhouse of Instagram. He's got 250,000 followers on Instagram. Guess that means that he's doing something right over there. We have a great chat about everything from light meters to monsters to why I have an irrational fear of peace lilies and it all gets very interesting. It's a long one. I hope you will be able to stick around for the whole show. I will break the interview uh, in the middle for a bit of a Q&A and some housekeeping. But without further ado, let's crack into my chat with Daryl because I just know you're going to love it. Oh, but just before we begin, uh, trigger warning, if you have a monstera called Dave, I apologise in advance. And also, if you're a fan of Ficus Lyrata, you may want to block your ears as I begin my ferocious takedown of the fiddle leaf fig. Complaints, you know whether you can send them on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. And on that note, let's go. I'm Daryl, uh, the creator of Houseplant Journal. Um, initially started as a Tumblr account, YouTube channel, uh, but it's kind of really taken off more as an Instagram account. And that's really just where I like to share photographs of my plants. Uh, I'm, I guess, p- perhaps more well known for making time lapse videos of plants. Let's start with the time lapses because these are so cool. And I do not have the first idea how you make these, but they're so (laughs) interesting because I think we have this idea that plants just sit there, but your time lapses clearly show that is not the case. How did this time lapse stream start happening? Uh, Well, on on Tumblr, uh, the the thing that's very popular on Tumblr is making uh, GIFs or animated little picture, like quickly uh, animation, little, little animations. And, uh, I felt like, well, when I, like, you know, you see, you see a Fetonia and it's all drooped over and then you water it a couple hours later, you come back and it's fully perked up. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool to see this happening? Like as it happens. Right. And so, yeah, I just started off with, I, I would look around for whatever plants would, would show those signs of droopiness. I mean, which is how I, uh, know to, uh, you know, water a plant immediately <laughs> then, uh, yeah, then I would then I just kind of picked uh, well, not really. I can't really call them victims, but like it, you, whenever you have lots of plants, there will be bound to be some of them that uh, that you that you let go for a couple of days, and then they really start to to droop. And then yeah, I would put that into my kind of makeshift studio. It's basically just a desk um, with two with two lights on it, and have my DSLR camera set with a remote timer and also with an AC adapter because sometimes these can go for quite a few hours. Uh, yeah, and then just have them shoot about several hundred images, although I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of the more recent time lapses. I say that they run for 30 some days. That one obviously takes over like a th- several thousand pictures. But uh, then you just process them in a uh, like a video processor, like Adobe After Effects kind of thing. and it will basically make the animation for you. It's it's really fun to watch and uh, it's amazing what, what one can do. And it really does emphasize how much plants do move, whether it's uh, reaching for the light or, or recovering from uh, from a wilt or whatever it may be. It just really emphasizes to me how much uh, movement there is in our plants, which is fascinating. I mean, this is only one aspect of your very popular instagram account your sort of catch line on there is an engineer's approach to houseplant care so tell me a bit about your background uh you're an engineer i guess uh yes yes i studied uh, engineering uh more specifically something called industrial engineering and that encompasses Mm -hmm. things like uh what's called human factors or ergonomics so understanding how people work with systems or, or machines and one of the 
sort of specialties of that is uh, when you, especially when you when you try to understand how people learn a system and how they, what's called develop their mental model of how something works, right? So if you think about like uh, the inner workings of your automobile, like I don't really know exactly what happens in there, but I have a rough idea and enough to understand um, when I hear some weird noises, I know that there's something wrong. I know when the car is running fine. I know that if there's some other types of noises, I can safely ignore them for, or something like that, right? Because I have like a mental model of how it works. And so then that got me to thinking, have we applied the same thinking to how plants work? And uh, yeah, it's just really, it's kind of a fascinating thing. I think that's probably one of the reasons why I like doing the time-lapse videos because you get to see how how the plants work. And especially because normally you you don't get to sit there and watch the plants for hours and on, on end. So getting to do the time loss is kind of one way where you learn how plants work. Um, yeah. And your collection, tell me a bit about your personal collection of house plants. I know there are many, um, but what, uh, what, what was perhaps your first love when in the house plant world? Was there something that set you off on this journey? Well, I, I think by amongst the very few first house plants, the one that I really, was drawn to was the money tree, the Pachira aquatica. Uh, usually you find it braided up uh, in four stems together. And yeah, I, I think that one interested me because, you know, you always see them being sold uh, looking a certain way, meaning the four braids together and then the, the little tuft of foliage right on top, perfectly looking like a tree. And after about a year, I had mine. And it started to like flop over and I was wondering, well, what am I supposed to do with this now? And I, you know, read up online as, as they usually people do. And they said, oh, just, just cut it. And I was like, just, just cut it. You mean just chop off everything. And then that, that's sort of what, like what I, my impression of it was, yeah, just, just cut it off. So I just cut it back to nothing but a stump. And sure enough, it just kept growing. Um, yeah. And then it kind of made me think, well, that means when we go to the stores, all, everything we see there is kind of like grown to just the right size so that it's attractive to sell. And then I sometimes wonder, well, what if they don't sell all of them? And do they like outgrow themselves or do they have to, they probably have to chop them back like I was instructed to do, to do right? It's an interesting plant, that one. It's become so popular. It's, it hasn't quite got up there with uh, the... The sort of, uh, I suppose, the what am I thinking of that might be more popular, the, the moth orchid. But it is it is such a popular plant now. I have to say I had one of those and managed to kill it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm well known for killing plants. Um, I think it was probably because it was in my son's room on the top of a wardrobe and mm -hmm. um, was forgotten about for quite some time. So I, I can't claim to be any great grower of that plant. I haven't tried again since. It tends to put me off when I kill something, and I, I should really be more persistent. Um, but mm -hmm. you you have um, obviously expanded from there to grow many, many different plants. Your collection, the, fr from looking at your Instagram account, how many plants do you reckon you have now? Are they... Uh, is it is it an influx or have you got a fairly steady collection now? I, I would say it's it's fairly steady uh, and currently being spread out to my my new place. So the the Instagram account was built off of uh, I mean like in terms of the photos, they're all from my my parents' house, which I was living at uh, while I was waiting for my own apartment to be completed uh, construction, which <laughs> took quite a number of years. Um, but so the, that original, like all these things on my Instagram, you, you could say that having the two skylights in the home, not only made for a great, uh, place to grow some low light plants, but also made for great photographs. Yeah. I think that's the thing, isn't it? And, and on Instagram, I mean, wow, you have an incredible 246,000 followers. So that's an, inc <laughs> you're obviously doing something right on there. What are your tips for making good house plant instagram photos what's your secret you know it's kind of a funny thing when i think about like because you know uh, being an engineer i like to think about uh all the contributing factors to any kind of result right uh so i would say that let, let's put the focus off of me and the things that i've done and i'll just kind of say 
all the different places where I had, let's say, call it like fortunate exposure, right? Um, so I think very early on, three years ago, there weren't as quite as many like house plant accounts, right? And so when that happened, when I came on, uh, a very prominent uh, uh, plant shop in New York called DeSil, uh, they at the time they were already quite big, and they they featured me. And I remember that night, I looked at my Instagram account, and it went up by 200 followers. The little number on the on the <laughs> the little heart thing only goes up to 100. But uh, anyway, the uh, when they featured me, my account grew quite quite large. So that was. A very fortunate event and then also when I started when Instagram allowed uh, 15 second videos that's when I started putting my time-lapse videos on and those got picked up by uh, some of these very big um, Facebook uh, like video aggregators like now this um, there's an EBC in Taiwan there's uh, something from Spain I can't remember the name but a lot of these you know, they, they compile a video saying like, oh, this uh, houseplant journal puts together Tyler's videos and then put some nice music behind it and a compilation of my videos. And those probably all, if I count them all together, they must have in excess of 20 million views if you count them all together. So the, these these kinds of things are, I would say, like uh, mostly just luck. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I bl- well, I wouldn't put it quite down to luck, but I think it, I can I can see what you're saying. It's you kind of got onto the the wave of interest in houseplants at exactly the right time, and of course, I think one of the the key plants that is features on all your your platforms is your Monstra deliciosa, um, which is mm-hmm. a wonderful looking plant. Tell me the story behind that. Ah, okay. Yeah, that that one definitely is. Uh, I would say probably my absolute favorite. You know, it's hard to choose favorites amongst all your plants, right? But that one is certainly an easy favorite to say. Uh, that one, I, I at the time, it was about four years ago, looking through, um, in Canada, we have something called Kijiji, which is just a classified ads. And I was just looking for plants on there. And I happened to stumble across this ad for, for a Monstera Deliciosa. It was ten dollars for for a relatively gangly looking plant and the owner just said you know they they had the plant for a year they didn't they didn't want to take care of it anymore because it was just getting too uh, kind of out of hand right as monsters tend to um so i went picked it up and bought it and in my house it was growing quite nicely for a while and that was the first time i noticed um you know just being really fascinated with with the leaf shapes and how how they not okay <laughs> speaking of leaf shapes i think the way that we describe the way that leaves change has often misled people to think that one individual leaf will will sort of morph into a leaf that has more holes and fenestrations in it right but uh when, when in fact it is you know each leaf has its own shape basically predetermined and it is the next leaf that has a chance to have more complexity if the conditions are correct. That's a really good point because I think you're right. People are misled into thinking, oh, this leaf suddenly going to split <laughs> uh, halfway through its yeah, life, yeah. which, as you say, is is not the case. I mean, I think it's I, I noticed on your Instagram that you ha- now have the um, a Thai constellation, which I also have to um, in fact, yours looks pretty similar to mine in terms of mine's slightly bigger. I think I have two seedlings and um, it's amazing mm. because suddenly it's been so slow growing. And then suddenly one of them just put out this uh, not not uh, split, but this massive leaf. And I was suddenly like, OK, here we go. Um, but I'm now waiting to see uh, how long it's going to be before the, the next leaf arrives and whether it's split or not. But they are. They are great fun, I have to say. And and so this plant's been with you for for how long? Your your original monstera? Uh, just over four years now. And uh, dur- during that time, it. Uh, so I, I was going to continue the story that I moved it. Yeah, sorry, but go- when we went off on a tangent, there. Oh, no, it's, it's okay. I, I sidetracked <laughs> myself here. <laughs> so uh, then I moved it from my home uh, to to my church, 
And my church has this one kind of Sunday school classroom that has a nice uh, French doors with with uh, like, you know, it's all windowed. And then also on the other side, uh, a north facing, very large window. Um, yeah, so th- that was kind of that where the plant has been living for the past, I think, about three years and also growing quite tall. And uh, obviously, as I've been asked so many times about how do you like control the monstera and then now i have like a specific blog post dedicated to talking about the the trellis that i've been using which is like a very sturdy um vegetable trellis that's kind of in the shape of a triangle and yeah i mean i just i just tie it with soft rubber ties some people talk about having to use like having it root against like a Mm. moss pole or something um but i i when i spoke to my my friend who who owns one of the nurseries I asked him about a, the uh, pothos totem. You know, the you have a pothos growing up against like a like a mm. log or a piece of wood, and he was saying that those are very difficult to to start yourself because you have to keep the wood right. irrigated. And sometimes when you're indoors, that's that may not be such a wise thing to do to keep something mm. constantly mm. moist, <laughs> especially if the airflow is not quite yeah. like a nursery, yeah. right? So anyway, the monstera I just tied up against the trellis, and uh, even though it's not rooted against the trellis, just the fact that the vine knows that it's going upwards has caused those later leaves to be much larger and also more complex. And are you delighted that four years after you got this plant that that the monstera Monday is a really big thing and everyone's growing these plants. It, it, but and that must mean, as you say, you get so many inquiries to your, to your website asking for advice because everybody's got, in fact, this week, my sister put a picture of, of her uh, Swiss cheese plant on my Facebook wall and said, what's wrong with my, <laughs> what's wrong with my monstera deliciosa? And I was like, Oh, well, it doesn't look like it's getting enough light. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's such a common question and it's great that you've got, bags of experience to to help people out with this one because you know the the old saw of kind of bright indirect light is not necessarily the easiest thing to fulfill for some people depending on on your your light situation and so on i guess that's why you moved it to to its current location so that it's you know that it's really happy there that, yeah that's right uh and, and I, i'm glad you brought up this uh, bright indirect light uh, notion because I, I think if we really sort of like take a tally of all the different plants that we bring into our homes, I think ninety percent of them say that bright indirect light is preferred, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, I okay as an engineer, I would think about this and think, okay, if I heard these words, then I still need to go and figure out what they mean, right? And so. That's that's what led me to uh, be really gung ho about the light meter and measuring foot candles and everything. Um, and, and I would just like I mean they're they're available on your phone now too, so it's not there's no excuse not to have one. <laughs> I have it on my phone, and I, I there was a few months I probably still do it now, but I just walk around my place and measure the light everywhere I am. Right, I found that the reading changed like quite drastically, and so. I would say to myself, if the readings can change this drastically, then how can we be so uh, so flippant about, oh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you put your plant uh, one foot away or five feet away and it, from a window. And yet when I would go and measure it, I would notice like a tenfold difference in the light intensity reading. So it's like I tried to think of, OK, how can I help people understand like give them a better guideline of what exactly it means to have bright indirect light. And this is where I came up with the, with the saying of, Oh, let your plant see the sky. And if, if you can let it see more of the sky, meaning you have a bigger window or there's less obstructions outside, then that's more indirect light. Tell me first of all, though, what is the app on your phone that you use as a light meter? Cause that's, that's, I've not heard of that before. And I'm, definitely want to find out more on android there's an app called light meter okay yeah it's very simple uh oh but i have been in the process of developing my own app um ah but interesting in, but in doing so i've noticed that the uh let's call it hardware restrictions are different between android and ios 
So it's been a little bit tricky to try and get the app on uh, on uh, on the iOS. But if you have an Android phone, then um, this app and in the future, my own app will will suffice. Okay, well that's interesting. That's I guess that's a natural thing for you to do, given given that you've you've tried this out and you're really engaged in it. I can I'm looking forward to trying out your app. When it, how how long do you think it's going to be before it's available? I'm hoping in the next uh, in the next few months. Uh, it, it, I'm fortunate to work in a software developing company, so there's. Plenty of ah. developers around me who are who are able to do to do this kind of work. <laughs> well, that that sounds like a great idea because, as you say, I think uh, we can be a bit intimidated by the idea of buying a gadget. But hey, if it's an app you can have on your phone, then it seems kind of much more accessible mm-hmm. um, and and presumably accurate enough to give you a really good idea of what uh, what what light is available in your your room. Yeah, and, and actually, even just. Uh, <laughs> in a way, shooting myself in the foot here. I, I've even tried to go beyond having to use the light meter and just kind of develop some, I guess, guidelines that are at least in line with how the light changes on a light meter, like in light meter reading. So as I said, like, you know, you walk five feet away from a window and then you walk closer and you notice that there's it goes from 100 foot candles up to 1,000. And then I ask myself, okay, so what what is physically in front of me that's making this reading uh, change so much, right? And that's why I said, uh, like I coined the saying of see the sky, because your angle of view of the sky is getting bigger as you move closer to the window. Because if you think of the window as like a constricted view of the sky, then you're you're making that view wider the closer you go to it, right? And all of these are in relation to indirect light because you don't need to use a light meter to know that you have direct sun because the sun is in direct line of sight with whatever your your plant is, right? It's it's all this indirect light where people are like they they maybe they don't have as good a sense of it. Yeah, I'm, I think I count myself really lucky because I have um, the back of my house house faces north mm-hmm. and. I have a an extension which has a glass roof on it, so it's north facing, but it's right, right. very light, which is perfect for plants. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really really handy because I don't have a lot of um, window sills in my house, strangely enough, despite the fact my podcast is called <laughs> on the ledge. Um, and so that room is really really handy for certain plants where you need them to have lots of light, but you don't want them to be in direct sun. So that's where my two of my uh, my monsters are at the minute and uh yeah, oh, yeah they... it's, I'm, I'm gonna have to get rid of some furniture so i can have more plants in there <laughs> i think is the only way forward but um yeah it's uh, that's that's a really good point and i think it's i think it's refreshing to to hear your approach because so often as you say it's kind of like they need the, the bright but indirect light or same with humidity it's it's kind of like i suspect you when when you think about a plant how much humidity it needs you're looking for a number as opposed to high or <laughs> Medium. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, so, so one of the funny things about uh, engineering versus science is that in science, we, we want uh, very specific accuracy for the sake of like full understanding. Whereas in engineering, we want accurate enough just to make the right decision. So ah, it's funny okay. that you mentioned humidity because I, I have many hygrometers sitting around all my plants and like I've never seen the hydro, like the humidity, uh, at least so in in an indoor environment in Toronto. I've never seen the the hygrometer go any less than thirty percent in the middle of winter. And so, I feel as though a lot of this fear of low humidity, it, it just comes from maybe some, like, the fear of any tiny imperfection on your plant and then you just blame it on humidity <laughs> you could be onto something there i think that that is uh yeah that's definitely uh an issue for some of us i mean the humidity does play a, a role in like let's say the rate of transpiration so that affects your water usage and uh if if your plant is transpiring a lot it could therefore be building up salts or whatever it is in the leaf tips then they find they go brown right but i just feel as though in general, if their humidity is not absurdly low, then I would say about 80% of any plant that you that we call house plants, they'll be generally fine. When you get 
you obviously get, I'm sure, many, many people uh, asking you questions, sending you questions. What is the number one most common question that you get other than why has my plant died? Perhaps is there one question that everyone wants to know the answer to? Well, uh, well other than you mean just showing me a picture of saying what's wrong <laughs> with my plant? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's the thing. I mean, and that's that in a way that's such a challenge because. I mean, I, I, you know, obviously I ask for questions on, on my podcast and sometimes you're presented with uh, somebody who has a plant which has, you know, why has my plant dropped half its leaves? Mm. And, you know, you don't have any idea of where the plant is. You know, you need more information generally uh, yes, than yes. the person's provided. So do you, what do you do? Do you kind of go back and ask for a full plant history well yeah i I would say that uh okay a lot of the times if someone's asking you the question of okay what's wrong with my plant but then they don't provide exactly that inform those other pieces of information that you asked for i think it implies that perhaps they really have no clue what's happening and in terms of even what what affects the plant health right and so it's it's uh it's almost as though every time I answer a question, I have to also, um, well, not like lecture, but like teach teach them a bit about how, in general, a plant works, right? And I think if you understand that little bit of biology in terms of, uh, you know, I always say light starts the whole process. Nothing else matters until the light is correct first, right? Because um, even... I can't tell you how often to water because it depends on the light mostly. Right. So it's, it's like, it's like I need to go into the same, um, as I said, developing that mental model of how a plant works. I have to go into every single time I answer a question. And do you find that sort of annoying or gratifying to, to, to kind of feel like you're kind of going to sort of house plant one Oh one every time you kind of answer a question? Uh, I, I would say it's gratifying for those who 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 let's say see the light and then they really realize that you know they can truly enjoy their plants when the, once they understand this right. Um, there are times where it, it's not as gratifying when when I get asked the same question like let's say from the same same person here and there and it's like I thought I explained this to you already, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it I guess. Another another aspect is um, whether they feel like the plant problem is um, purely aesthetic or like they because, for example, as you say, if older leaves, older leaves, when they fall off, part of my my uh, philosophy is that, well, your plant is just doing the best that it can, given its conditions. And it's one condition that you've really kind of hampered is the, the light part because your walls and ceiling are opaque. That's, that's like a, at, at the very best you can get 25% of the light that you used to get at the nursery. So yeah, yeah. once you've hampered that so far, your, your plant is going to, you know, your plant is almost like, it, it's like a, it's like a colony of, of different parts that all work together. And just like in a company that was not doing so well, they have to make cuts, right? They have to, they have to lay off people. And so in a plant, they have to lay off the older leaves so that it doesn't waste its time trying to uh, supply energy to lower leaves that are not doing any photosynthesis work. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Um, and that brings me neatly on to another question, which is, do you, how do you, as an engineer with your engineer's approach to plants, do you kind of find it do you become irritated by the kind of anthropomorphization of plants kind of there is a bit of a kind of a cutesy plant thing going on where it's kind of like oh i'm gonna buy this i'm gonna buy this monster and i'm gonna (laughs) call it dave i mean it can be quite endearing but sometimes perhaps uh i don't know whether as an engineer you feel like well hey actually that's not how we should be viewing um, our plant collections. We should be having a different perspective on them than trying to trying to make them into kind of char- cute, cutesy characters. I guess sometimes when it's uh, when it's so anthropomorphized that it affects the way people care for the plant, then yes, that does kind of irk me um, because 
if like if I keep teaching that, okay, you need to understand how plants work. Well, if some sort of um, thinking is like, oh, I don't want to prune the plant because I'm hurting it. Well, then <laughs> <laughs> that that's not really the case because that's not how plants work, right? They're they're made to be broken in half and then grow two new plants, right? Which is amazing. It's it's something that's if we anthropomorphize, then we're sort of like diminishing the plant's special abilities that we don't have. Have you got more things that you want to achieve in terms of, um, I don't know, either your own collection or time lapses or what, what's coming next for Houseplant Journal? I think I would like to go back into making YouTube videos. I made a few uh, several years ago and they've just been sort of sitting there. Uh, and, and I think sort of like documenting the process of taking care of plants and uh, maybe interviewing people with their thoughts about plants, sort of like this podcast, <laughs> is something mm -hmm. that I really I really enjoy doing. Actually, in fact, I'd like to tell you that um, when I first discovered your podcast, it was at the time when my, at the time, fiance was living two and a half hours away in a different town at, at university. And so every time I would visit her, I would be really looking forward to it not only just to see her, but also that I would have two and a half hours of just playing your podcast on repeat. Oh, that's, that's really nice to hear. It's it's really strange making a podcast because you kind of put it out there and then you know that people are listening to it because you can see the stats. But it is really nice to hear from people uh, who actually say, I've been listening to your podcast and I've been really enjoying it. And it does make all this, the toil worthwhile. <laughs> so that's really nice to hear. And um, are there, you can tell me, are there any things that I should cover? What episodes should I be doing? What other things should I be covering that I haven't covered already mm, in all these 60 uh... odd episodes <laughs> I've done? I'm thinking that I would like to do an episode on... The one I think which is maybe one of your favorite plants because it features quite a lot, which is the Sansevieria family. Um, oh, yes. I've yes. done some stuff on those, but that that's a really great plant family, isn't it? We're just starting to realize how how big and interesting that plant family is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, the, the funny thing with the podcast is that so especially about plants is that plants. I think the reason why they're popular on Instagram is because just like food and beauty and travel plants are a very visual visually appealing uh, thing right so naturally if people start to have a whole feed just dedicated to plants that that would be a very um, nice thing to have right but a podcast about plants is like you have to you're getting at the thoughts about plants right and so when you talk about the sense of area it's like you'll want to discuss all these different um, cultivars and different species, and then you're going to have to find pictures of all of them. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is true. That is a good point. Yeah, I think that's the thing is I try to make sure that the show notes that go with each episode are kind of as extensive as possible. Uh, not always easy. I mean, of, the other problem with for me of doing the podcast is that at the end of every episode, I've got another whole list of plants that I want to buy um, and get my hands on. Uh, so, yeah, I, mm -hmm. it's uh, it, it's a never ending stream of uh, a, my experience expanding wish list going on and on and on into infinity uh, and obviously i don't have uh, an un unending space uh, but <laughs> but it, yeah it's it's um i always try to encourage people to listen to the show note to read the show notes while they're listening so that they can kind of get the visual thing going on as well as the um as hearing about plants but it's amazing how much you can get across in in a podcast actually without actually having any visuals and i have had people say well how can you talk about plants if you can't see them but uh hopefully we're throwing up some mental images at, at the same time but i think also uh it, when it's in a podcast format then you're kind of really diving deeper into the way someone thinks about plants right and they can go much more into detail than just oh, you know, it's bright indirect light, <laughs> as I sort of did earlier. <laughs> I think that's a nice thing in that hopefully there's something there for the sort of people who are just starting out about, and also those who have kind of, I know lots of my listeners are, you know, botanists and people who are seriously mm. knowledgeable about this stuff, which I'm always very aware of and slightly scared about, but it's it's all okay. <laughs> and um, what is your, are there any plants that you don't have that you still uh, are desperately seeking? Is it that 
variegated double Z plant or what's what would you really like to get your hands on? Actually, yeah, now that you've mentioned that variegated ZZ plant, it's uh, I, I've only seen it, <laughs> I think, only in one person's feed one time. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely one of them. I did Google it today because funnily enough, I was talking about it with um, Colin Walker, who's been a guest on the show before. And he was talking because it's a sort of, well, it is kind of a, a succulent aroid. And uh, I, I did Google it. And yeah, there's some Thai, la- Thai nurseries okay. that have it. Uh, but yeah, other than that, it seems to be very, very exclusive. Who knows? One of the plants that I've seen a lot of uh, is the Raphidophora tetrasperma. Uh, it's it's kind of like a mini monstera in in that it has the cuts on the side, but it's the overall leaf I think is much smaller, like kind of more about the size of a palm. Uh, I saw one in a collection when I was in Singapore. Um, obviously, could not take a cutting, even though the the person obviously he uh, <laughs> was perfectly willing to offer me one, but I could not take it back through to Canada. <laughs> Yeah, now that that is one that seems to be getting very, very popular um, and cuttings going for a large amount of money over here as well. So uh, and, and talking about cuttings, you, you are you an inveterate propagator? Are you like me where you're propagating things even when you don't really need to propagate them? Just oh, yeah, it's yeah. Fun? Uh, well, at, well, at my parents house where the where the rest of my collection is, there's definitely lots of uh of the various glass vases set up to do the propagations. And I think one of the, one of the, one of the image subjects that does very well on Instagram is your propagation station. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I have, I have quite a number of things propagating too, but at, at this point they're probably just living in the, in the water, uh, indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a fine line between propagation and water culture, isn't there? And I think oftentimes things cross over and uh, and start becoming uh, water propagated, which is which is okay. Yeah. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that either. So. <laughs> We'll be back with Daryl shortly, but it's time for question of the week, which comes from Darcy. She has a problem with a Hoya, specifically Hoya lanceolata bella, and it's hanging in her kitchen conservatory and has put on lots of new growth, which is great. Well done, Darcy. But she's now finding that the flower buds that develop just get about the size of a pencil eraser and then turn yellow and fall off. And she wants to know why is this happening? Well, if any of you have spent any time on a Hoya plant forum online, you will know that this is such a common problem with this plant that really you should feel like it's a badge of honour, Darcy, that your Hoya has decided to drop its flower buds. There are many different reasons why this can happen. And even the most experienced Hoya growers go through this issue and don't really understand why. Uh, There are a few things that you can think about uh, and consider whether they are the cause. One of which is that the plant might be in a draft or the conditions might have changed somehow as the weather's getting cooler. Perhaps there's more of a draft blowing through. That may be the cause. It doesn't sound like you have moved the pot recently, but if you have moved the pot, then that can be a reason for Hoya buds to fall. Even just rotating the pot or moving it about when you are bringing it down to water it and then putting it up the other way around, that could be enough to cause these flower buds to drop. You do need to let the soil dry out in between waterings and again, irregular watering or perhaps the compost being a little bit too dry could be another cause. I know I'm really not helping here, am I? Because I'm just giving you a panoply of different problems that need to be solved. But I think the main message for you, Darcy, is try not to worry about it. From the photo you sent, your plant looks lovely and healthy. And I think when the time is right, those flower buds will stick around and go through to completion. And I really hope they do because wax flower or Hoya has a most beautiful flower. The cluster of flowers, like little tiny stars, are very, very beautiful. My other query would be about your fertilisation regime. You say that you're fertilising it twice a month. Many growers of Hoyas will reduce feeding in the run up to and during flowering because this can actually inhibit flowering. So again, do remember that obviously as the autumn arrives, you will need to reduce the watering. But don't worry, I think your plant will be fine and it will always have another go at flowering. So don't despair. You're in it for the long term. 
Darcy and I really wish you luck with this plant. Do let me know if you manage to get those flowers to fully bloom. I've got my fingers crossed for you. If you've got a question for On The Ledge podcast, do give me a shout. On The Ledge podcast at gmail.com is a great way of getting in touch with me. In other news, thank you to my two new Patreon subscribers this week, Colin and Nicole. They've bagged themselves access to my exclusive content via my Patreon feed. And they're also helping to support the show with a donation of $5 a month or more. If you want to give a one-off donation like Sally did this week, thank you Sally, then you can also find the details of how to do that there. If you happen to be in travelling distance of Bedford in the UK, then I'm doing a special plant therapy talk and workshop on Thursday the 4th of October. Details on my website and I'd love to see you there. It'd be great to have some legends in the audience. If you're coming along, do bring some houseplants with you and I may just have a few houseplants for sale as well. And if you're in London, don't forget you'll see me at the RHS London Urban Garden Show on Friday the 26th. But if you can't make either of those, don't worry because I shall be continuing to pump out podcasts over here ad infinitum. You'll get sick of me eventually. And don't forget to join in the chat over at Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge on Facebook. It's a great place to hang out with fellow enthusiasts and find out what we're all growing. There is still time to enter my Calais Choe giveaway. Visit my Instagram account j.l.perone to enter and find out the terms and conditions. If you're UK based, you can enter for your chance to win £50 worth of Calais Choe's from Always Calais Choe, my podcast partner of last week's episode. But now, without further ado, let's get back to my chat with Daryl. I've just seen on your Instagram feed that you have uh, an Instagram stories thing on light meters, which I'm definitely going to go and have to have a look at. I also see that you've you've got something on Pileas up there. Are you a Pilea Peperomioides fan or are you a reluctant kind of, OK, everyone's into this, so therefore I've got to kind of do something on it? Or how, how do you feel about them? Uh, no, no, I, I'm definitely a fan of them. Uh, when I, I got my first one from a, from like a, someone someone just offering their, their little baby, right? And yeah, I think the Pilea is a very interesting plant in that it lets you see this life cycle in a very obvious way. Because, I mean, you know, sense of areas, they put out little runners every now and then. Uh, spider plants, too, also put out the babies. But uh, the pilea tends to tends to be like it has a lot of babies if, if it has, a, you know, good uh, bright indirect light. Yes. <laughs> if it has that, then, um, you know, the adult can quickly produce like almost a dozen babies. And it's just... Yeah, like it, it, it almost puzzled me as to how nurseries couldn't stock this plant because it seems to reproduce just, you know, too quickly. No, the same things occurred to me. It's like, how how is there not, how is there a shortage of this plant when it's just so easy to, I still don't understand. Do you, have you come to any conclusions? Because I still don't know the answer to that. Uh, well, I, I think now it is becoming in much greater supply, like so, so much that when I go to my grocery store, there's a you know pre-packaged pilea little kit that comes with one pilea and then two little pots that say oh when your babies grow bigger you can give them away to friends. Oh really? So like okay. and this is like a pre-packaged thing so it must be that now this nursery must have loads and loads of them enough to sell them at a commercial scale. Hmm. But uh, is 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 it not the case in the UK? Yeah, the, you do see them in more specialist plant shops, but they're not as widely available as I think they are in the US at the moment. But yeah, it's it's getting there. It's getting there, definitely. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of always championing some of the other members of the Pilea clan. You know, the um, I can't even remember the Latin name now. Uh, uh, yes, the yes. aluminium plant, uh, Cadaria or whatever it's called. I really like that one. That reminds me of, I'm, that was one of my early house plants when I was a kid. So I'm kind of slightly, um, I always feel slightly... Um, nostalgic for that one and in volucrata as well which is the one with the dark alternate dark and light very dark red and silver stripes on it i rather like that one as well yeah. so i'm kind of yeah trying to get people to 
to think about other pie layers. And Moon Valley as well is another one of my favourites with the very deeply ruffled kind of leaves. But yeah, I guess I'm just old school. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and in fact, it's quite hard to get hold of some of those other pie layers now in the way that it was hard to get hold of the Chinese money plant a few years ago. So uh, that, yeah, it, it, uh, fashion's changed. This actually brings up two thoughts. So I'm going to just go through them sequentially. But the first one is how... Uh, you know, the space that is available in commercial nurseries is limited, right? So they have to choose what what they're going to stock, and yet they won't be able to sell it, like, at least a year or two later, right? So that's kind of a funny thing how uh, if the demand for some plant, for example, the pilea, probably three years ago when it was, like, the it plant on Instagram, uh, maybe they finally caught up to the demand now, Right. And then mm, mm. some some other day they're gonna there's gonna be a, some other plant on Instagram that really takes off, and then they're gonna say, <laughs> okay, now we need to make this one. But then they're gonna source it and then have to grow it, maybe clone it or something, and then it won't be enough for another two years before they <laughs> start selling them, right? Mm, mm. Yeah, that's that's I'm sure that's true. It, yeah, the lead time has to be to be there, and uh, it's hard to be uh, reactive to wrap quick enough to these things. I mean, I know there's a shortage of the variegated mm-hmm. monsters now. Um, so, I mean, that presumably will take a while to correct because of the, the slow growing nature of the plant. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what is the next big, you know, fiddle leaf fig or monster or, uh, or Chinese money plant. I'm not sure what is the next yeah. big thing. I, it's uh, hard to say. Th- have to do a <laughs> have to do a sort of an a, an Instagram an Instagram survey and find out what people are uh-huh. posting about. And then the other thing that you mentioned about is the, you know how oh you're old school and you like this particular plant or it's been around when you were a kid. Then, it, you know, in, in fashion, the fashion that we see like on clothing is is produced and designed by people, right? So they they have full control over what it looks like. But plants are completely, you know, driven by nature, right? So, but yet we we take a appreciation of them from an aesthetic point of view, and then we start to develop, we start to associate certain plants with different styles. Like I think I vaguely recall that you are not very <laughs> fond of um, peace lilies because you find that the, they're very ordinary, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have mentioned that on the show before. You're right. <laughs> well, I happen to really like peace lilies, and and so then mm. you know when I'm getting excited about a peace lily, then for you, you probably look at it and be like, "Meh, that's that's not really that exciting to you." <laughs> <laughs> well, I I did the one I did see. I think I did mention mention this is that I I did see an enormous one in someone's house that must have been some particular cultivar that was just mm-hmm. it was just enormous i can't it was about three times the size of any other peace lily and i'm not talking about the size of the clump i'm talking about the Mm -hmm. size of the leaves uh and that was really stunning and i think it's it's uh yeah so i'm but you're right it's it's all these kind of totally unfounded (laughs) prejudice i mean when i did the coleus episode i said you know i used to really hate these plants and then I don't know, something happened. So I always leave the possibility open that I'm going to go from hating a Mm. plant to loving it um, because generally my prejudices are almost always completely unfounded. There's some things that I don't hate that I love, but I just won't grow because I don't want to torture myself. Like I, I, Nepenthes, I, you know, I just don't think they would make me happy because I think I'd be struggling with Mm -hmm. them the whole time. So in my current setup with my current, you know, um, options for growing things. I haven't got any of those, but, um, you never know. You never know. Never say never because there's so many plants that I've said, Oh, I'm never going to have one of those. And then lo and yeah, behold, I think, I think sometimes, sometimes <laughs> we also read. get turned off by, by plants that have maybe not been successful or maybe that have been, um, constantly riddled with pests. And, and so it's kind of a, like a funny thing, how these are both, purely on aesthetics but as you start to own plants you you also then kind of develop your own stories with each of different species or diff- your own experiences right indeed yeah yeah that's very true and you end up uh yeah changing your mind about about them over time they they, they make you change your mind which is a good thing i mean i mean i have to say um one plant that i've i've kind of not done particularly well with is air plants and i think (laughs) i kind of like how how can i be so rubbish with air plants and i think it's probably that i just don't quite 
care about them enough. It's a bit like how I used to be with orchids that I'm just kind of like, uh, mm, yeah. But I think uh, that I think that's mm. a key for me is that if I it's like the the Pachira aquatica on my top of my son's wardrobe, I just kind of gave up mm-hmm, caring mm-hmm. about it. And that is for me is the moment when it, it all goes horribly wrong because I just won't be motivated to care for that plant and water it and keep it well. Uh, whereas plants that I treasure and that I that I put prominent in prominent places where I see them regularly and I know immediately when there's a problem, those are the plants that I really tend and love. Yeah, it's it's a funny kind of like a, a feedback cycle that happens. Um, but I think even for me, like the very popular fiddle leaf fig, I'm going to go on record here and say that I don't really like it only because I I don't like the way that it will drop all of its older leaves. And, and you're kind of, it's like such a nice big leaf it's it's such it's like really heartbreaking when one of them falls off, right? Whereas with my monstera, I've lost yep. maybe just uh, four or five leaves over the five years that it's been there, right? And but but at the same time, I've gained mm. so many more. I haven't got a. I've, I've, it's not a plant that I've got. I fiddle leaf fig. I've seen them. I've had the opportunity to buy them, and I haven't bought them. I would be more interested in having um, a ficus uh, audrey. Actually, I think the leaves are nicer. Yes, I think the fiddle leaf. This is maybe absolute sacrilege to some people, but I think the leaves of the fiddle leaf fig are a little mm-hmm. bit coarse. And I actually prefer the leaves of Audrey, Bengalensis Audrey. I think they're a bit more refined, but perhaps that's just me. Again, I, I'll probably in six months' time be eating my words and um, growing fiddle leaf figs. But yeah, I just find them a little bit, I can't think of any other better way to describe them than coarse and just, uh, I don't know. I, it's a it's a tactile thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> again, I probably got listeners uh, fainting as I... Uh, criticize the fiddle leaf fig but again i think it you know it's okay not to like all plants and in a way it's a good job that we don't like all plants otherwise literally we would have no money in our bank accounts because (laughs) you've you've got to make some choices about what plants you can afford and what plants you can fit in your place right so uh yeah it's um it's horses for courses i guess i guess that's and and of course more importantly i would say what plants will will even grow well in your space well, exactly. You just you've got to be realistic about what will work for you. And uh, I mean, what's your new apartment like in terms of plant friendliness? So it's a really funny uh, story where I took. So the first day I went into my new apartment and I, I actually felt a little bit sad that because because I understood like I had my own understanding of light and, you know, I'm so gung ho about it that I, that I, I know that everything starts with the light. And the moment that I realized that the light was, you know, just not quite as good as my old place, I was a little bit sad. Um, now, okay. In reality, it's not terrible either. I mean, I have floor to ceiling windows facing West. Uh, the only problem is that there's a, the balcony overhang from the previous, like from the upper floors. Right. So because of the space, because of being uh, not like not having that fully unobstructed view right up against the window. Like I have the balcony overhang that covers, let's say about 25% of the angle. um, Even if I have a plant right up against the window. So I've, I've measured the light there and for for most of the day, it's anywhere between um, 200 to 600 foot candles. And then when the sun shines, obviously that goes way over 8,000. But the point is for the, for the most of the other time, it is suitable for a number of plants. Um, yeah. And, but it's not quite as good as my old place <laughs> because <laughs> well, sky, skylights, to... nothing beats skylights. Right. And as you, you have a mm. North, uh, you, you said you have a, a glass enclosure. Yeah, so it's like a basically a, a room which is, has a glass. It's like a, it's like a conservatory except the walls are brick and there's a patio doors at the end and then glass on on the roof. So that's um, yeah. Um, the, in fact, it's the room that I'm pictured in on my about page, which is the which, as some people have pointed out, is is green. It's a grey green room and the walls are painted green. Okay. Um, so it's quite um, it's it. There's quite a few plants in there, as my husband will tell you. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, because by the principle of see the sky, that room can see like sky all around. Right. So that light would be absolutely perfect for any tropical foliage plant. 
it is very good and it's not too cold it does get a little bit chilly out there but it only gets down to about 16 which in the winter which is not too bad for uh, most house plants so yeah i just have to be a little bit careful mm-hmm. most of them can withstand it yeah. Well, it's been lovely to chat to you, Daryl. I'm aware that we're coming up on an hour now, so I don't want to hold you too long. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to talk about or anything else you wanted to plug or uh, promote before we go? <laughs> um, well, uh, coming spring, spring 2019, um, the book that I've been working on for the past year or so will be released. So uh, that's that's very exciting. And it, it basically, it, it's like encompassing all this kind of engineering thinking about plants um you know i have i had i had little diagrams made that kind of help you understand what's going on in the soil i've written about using light meters and i tried my best to emphasize the importance of light and how it's kind of like the the start of everything like all these sorts of different uh, uh ways of thinking about plants I, i've tried to include that in the book Fantastic. And is that something, is that coming out as a self-published book or is he going through a publisher or how is it coming to us? Uh, it, it's through a publisher. Um, oh, wow. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if I can go on air. <laughs> Are you allowed to say what it's called or is it all still top secret? I won't say what it's called, but I will say that it is uh, being published through Abrams. Okay. Well, I'm really looking forward to reading that. You know, that's going to be a, a really interesting, um, interesting read for me. And as you know, from listening to the podcast, my, my hero is, I don't know if you if even have this book in Canada or if it's totally alien to you, the, the Houseplant Expert series, which I'm always banging on about, Dr. Heseon. Perhaps you're going to be the new, perhaps that's your role <laughs> in life. You're going to, your book is going to topple Dr. Heseon off his throne and you're going to become... The new houseplant uh, expert um, hero. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, if if there's any reason to topple over anyone for the houseplant, uh, you know, expert kind of kind of throne, I, I would really just want it because I want to free people's minds from from what feels like fragmented tips and tricks and just. Give them like a solid foundation so that they can have the confidence to just take on any plant and enjoy it for however long it lasts in your space. Yeah, that's that's kind of the, the my thinking of when I wrote when I wrote my book and even when I explain it to the many friends who uh, asked me about plants now that they know that I love plants so much. <laughs> well, the great thing is now all of those friends and family, you can do, just read the book guys. You don't need to, <laughs> you can get them all off your back because you've got the book. Well, I'm really looking forward to reading that Daryl. And, and thanks so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jane. that's all for this week's show thanks so much to my guest daryl cheng you can find him on instagram as houseplant journal and his website is houseplantjournal.com visit my show notes for more details about daryl and the plants we've discussed today i'll be back next friday for more houseplant fun in the meantime dave the monster i'm so sorry take care bye
The music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, A Man Approaches with Bode Sitar by Samuel Corwin, and Overthrown by Josh Wadwood, all licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details. 